put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, Moon Review. We open with a flashback. Professor Broom talking to a young Hellboy who tries desperately to spit his lines past the humongous false teeth that they gave that poor kid actor. And Hellboy wants a story, and Broom decides to tell him the backstory for the film. Which is actually not that bad of a tale. It's better than the actual story of the film. Basically, what it boils down to is there is this robotic, I guess magic-powered, massive army that the, I think, elf people, something like that, once tried to use to beat back the humans who were trying to take over the world. Of course. And... Yeah, first the king, the elf king, face palms when he realizes that humans are, you know, trying to conquer the world. And then he face palms when he sees that his forces are beating back the humans. He's a very indecisive king. Yeah, so anyway, he, he and the humans agree to a truce, and the... There are these three pieces of a crown that the royal elf family, one member of the royal elf family will have to wear in a, in a crown to take control of the Golden Army, and uh, yes, the humans get some of the, these pieces and some of the pieces stay with the elf family. Excuse me, fast forward to present, excuse me, present day, and the king's son, Prince Nuada, Luke Goss, who just loves, you know, taking these action roles where he's pale in Guillermo del Toro movies. Yeah. And, yeah, Prince Nuada is trying to reawaken the Golden Army, and Hellboy and company are supposed to try to stop him, but they do a pretty crap job. They actually do pretty poorly at all of their jobs in this movie. But yes, so that pretty well takes care of the plot. I should say some positive about this film, because it actually is not all bad. I will admit that. The action is quite cool, even if you know several of the battles tend to end up being pretty anticlimactic and ultimately pointless. Anyway, we were on the positives. It's a very attractive film. It's, you know, the visual effects are really, really good. And there are some very nice designs in the film. Although, you know, the visual effects actually tend to be overused. You know, it's it, it gets really close to George Lucas territory with just how many effect shots there are in this movie and how many of them, how, how large a percentage of them is are entirely pointless. And speaking of Lucas, we have the troll market scene where the amount of imaginative creatures and, you know, designs and ideas for such 
I don't know, it makes me think that, you know, this movie had a bit of a gangbang with the cantina scene from Star Wars, and this is the result. Sure, it's... it's yeah, the designs are nice, but why do we spend so long just looking at creatures who, at the end of the day, just don't actually matter in the grand scheme of just, yeah, you know, the, the scene is just there because they're, you know, it's essentially the... The, the design people behind the film and the effects people behind the film just, yeah, throwing everything they've got at us. There's really no, you know, and it actually becomes kind of boring and bland after a while when there's just that much, you know, yeah, that much splendor to take in and none of it actually, you know, very little of it actually matters. The characters, you know, part of what, make the, what makes the first film so great is the characters. And here, it's like they forgot what the characters are even like. I'd say Liz is nigh on unrecognizable, you know, just I, I can barely tell that this is the same character that was in the first movie. You know, Selma Blair plays her completely differently. I, I can respect that, you know, she changes over time. She grows as a human being. But this is just, this is barely the same person at all. You know, and the conflict of sorts, the, you know, the relationship conflict between her and Hellboy it just didn't do anything for me. I don't know if it's really supposed to be taken all that seriously, but the film sure develops, a, you know, or the film sure spends a lot of time with it. You know, in the first one, you could pretty well buy it. You know, you have these two people, and, you know, Liz really doesn't want to feel like a freak, and being with Hellboy, you know, it's kind of hard to ignore. Guys, you know, got file-bound horns and red skin, so yeah. You know, but by the end of that film, we have that, you know, nicely resolved. So this one kind of picks up, and now they're together, and there has to be conflict. So, uh, yeah, there's conflict. Don't know why, but there it is, you know. And Abe has a nice romantic subplot in this. Subplot, plot, I guess. And... Yeah, it's extremely bland and the kind of thing that you'd normally find in a bad romantic comedy, really. I know that it's not the actor's fault, but Abe's voice in this, they didn't get David Hyde Pierce back. And I respect his decision not to come back. And I believe it was even... Like, he didn't want the film to advertise that it had him in it, and then it did, and so he didn't want to return, something like that. But yeah, so this time, it's the actor who, again, I commend him for his agility. You know, his physical feats. The actor, Doug Jones, I think it's Doug Jones, in, you know, in this suit doing all this, and they, is, you know, they take more advantage of in this one than the first one. So yeah, now he's doing the voice, and he does an okay job. I think he's just a more compelling, well, I don't even know if it's his performance, it's just that the voice just sounds wrong compared to, you know, it's just David Hyde Pierce, you just, you can't completely imitate that, you know, it's it's the real one or it's not, it's, you know, David Hyde Pierce and Kelsey Grammer and uh, some others, it's just, the moment you hear them, that's that person, you know, and just, you can't properly imitate it and you shouldn't try. Manning and Hellboy are, you know, going at it again and, yeah, Manning's made really annoying in this one. 
And that actually segues nicely into the humor of this film. In the first one, it was largely natural, and there were a couple of, you know, silly kind of throwaway gags and stuff. <sighs> Speaking of throwaway, what happened to Agent Myers, you know? Some of us liked that they, you know, had this one, you know, the, what's it called, the, the straight man in there, you know? Very little of that in this film. I'll get to that. The humor. It's just so forced. You know, just, it, it's almost never funny. There, there's a fraction of it that it actually genuinely is funny. But it tries so hard to make the audience laugh. And it just gets really embarrassing and really annoying. But yeah, there's a lot of obnoxious in this film. Now, yeah, there's very little going on in the area of having a straight man in this film. You know, the first one, Clay was sort of the formerly straight man, but now he's kind of gotten used to it. Myers is the entirely straight man, you know. Myers is gone, and, you know, heck, Manning wasn't even that eccentric in the first one, and this, he's just constantly chattering away and really annoying. And then they bring in a couple of new, you know, Johann Krauss, a German ectoplasmic gaseous something who walks around in a suit that contains the gas. And yeah, it's it's the voice of Klaus from American Dad, so I guess he finally found that body he was always looking for. Seriously though, it is Seth MacFarlane, and he's doing that voice. I guess it just comes out that way when Seth MacFarlane does a German voice. But still, and I like Seth MacFarlane. I love American Dad. Why couldn't they find someone else though? Why? It, it's just, it's distracting, you know. But, yeah, so, he, you know, adds further to the kind of just weirdness of the film. And, you know, where in, in the first one that was kind of, they, they kept it slightly mysterious and they kept it interesting. In this one they're just wallowing in the weirdness and this, you know, outlandish, out you know, otherworldly stuff, and I don't know, maybe it appeals to some people, but there's no explanation for it, and there's hardly any reason for it. There's a ton of stuff in this where it just feels like, well, you know, here's room for something else that's weird, so let's do it, you know. And I'd also like to note, there are a couple of different ways of doing fantasy, and among them you can either have your stuff kind of make sense and, you know, yes, have, have actual explanations and, yeah, have, have things actually kind of make sense in a sort of, there, there's tendencies with, you know, say you have this magical being and they tend to do this or that and it's kind of, makes sense. Or you can just say, well, we've got magic, we can create any fantastical creature we want, so let's just do wish fulfillment, let's just joke around and have some fun with these magical creatures and never explain anything. And yeah, this film tends to go towards the latter. There is very little, yeah, explanation for things. There's also hardly any consequence with, yeah, I, I can't actually give any of it away, but if you've seen the movie, you can watch the spoiler written one. I will be going over it. And some of the battles just, you're left wondering, did, did we win? Was there a reason for the battle? Was it just, the, the, you know, the, the lead characters, the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense, are unforgivably irres irresponsible. They're just completely, not even remotely taking their job and duty seriously. 
The film is roughly as long as the first, which, you know, 110 minutes, but it feels so much longer. You know, the first one just flies by. And again, I've watched these both of these movies three or four times. This one, even the first viewing, it, it felt so long and just... Why is there a scene of Abe and Hellboy getting drunk and listening to sappy love music? There's a place for sappy love music. C coincidentally, before doing this review, I did a Google Maps search for it. And you know what it came up with? Not a freaking Hellboy movie! That's what! The music, I guess, is fine. I didn't notice it too much, but I think it worked out, you know, nicely enough. The moral is extremely heavy-handed, and this is coming from someone who agrees very much with the moral. But yeah, you know, it, the first one had a moral as well. It wasn't preachy, not even a little bit. You know, it... And that one, it really worked. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So yeah, to sum it up... A circle jerk of fantastical, mythical stuff that, you know, doesn't make sense and isn't explained. Characters that are, you know, not taking their rather important duty at all seriously, and who, frankly, I can't get behind, just... Yeah, unappealing, not quite people, but you know, you know what I mean. And yeah, effects just for the sake of effects. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.